Welcome to the Log Home and Rest Check training video brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy. You now can receive 0.10 CEUs towards ICC renewal certification and or 1.0 AIA CES learning units. However, in order to obtain AIA LUs, new AIA requirements dictated tests must be taken. At the end of this training video, you will be directed to a website to take the 10 question test applicable to AIA members only. You must answer eight of the 10 questions correctly in order to qualify for the 1.0 learning unit. CECP will report the AIA members who pass the test so credit can be awarded. A certificate of completion will also be available at the end of this training video. Today's broadcast on log homes and rest check is brought to you by Department of Energy. There will be three presenters, Rob Pickett, who represents the Log Homes Council as chairman of the ICC committee, charged with development of the standards for the design and construction of log structures. Heather Gillen with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's a mechanical engineer and the co-lead for software development of the Building Energy Coast program. And myself, Pam Cole, I'm also with Pacific Northwest National Lab, and I'm the lead for DOE's Building Energy Coast program for national technical assistance to users relating to energy code issues, compliance, and software training. And at this time, I'd like to take it over to Rob, who will start the presentation. Rob? Hello. Uh, in my presentation, I will uh, be providing a brief background of log building. Uh, the Log Homes Council and the efforts of the Log Homes Council to have log structures recognized and accepted in building codes and standards. Uh, the industry is built on a rich heritage dating as far back as 700 BC uh, in Eastern Europe. As North America was colonized, traditional log building methods were introduced, uh, buildings being assembled from materials available on site. This often explains the differences in roof type sealants and finishes between different regions of log construction. In fact, I've heard many stories of owners renovating a homestead only to find that the original structure was logged that had been covered over as other improvements were added. So we know that even the, the uh, old filaments are still surviving today and log structures are very durable. The industry now consists largely of producers to prepare the logs at the facility and truck them to a building site rather than using all the materials found on the on the building site. We're supported by a diligent network of suppliers of various fasteners, sealants, preservative products, and other uh, elements that allows us to continue uh, providing the latest technology available to log construction. CAD plan development and production technology continues to advance handcrafted and mill producers alike. So the next question might be, what's different about log homes? Primarily, it's the wall construction and the nature of the custom home design. Laying horizontally, most often the solid wood walls have their closest cousin in the coast being reinforced concrete masonry. But the same effort is required for all types of construction. The same project planning, preparation, development of design loads, and understanding uh, how they impact the structure. Plum square and level construction is extremely important as each level is built. And as any wood product, receiving, handling, and protecting the material is very important. Outside of personal likes and dislikes, there are five primary ways to differentiate log wall systems. The wall walls themselves vary from available species, size, shape, uh, treatments such as preservative treatments, and moisture content. Some wall logs are, are delivered in a green state, which means that they are only dry through nature. Some are go through a, an air drying process, and some are actually uh, kiln dried. The extent of processing is very important in terms of what happens on the job site. Uh, for a builder who is experienced and is uh, a craftsman of his own uh, at his own level, um, linear length logs provide a very good option. It allows a lot of uh, craftsmanship on site. 
for a builder who's entering the, the law firm industry, a pre-cut or a handcrafted method gives uh, the same quality uh, and a little bit easier for the builder to join in. Joinery is a critical element of the wall, but it is also an element that each law home company has taken great efforts to, to uh, improve because they rely on that joinery as well. Connection and fastening patterns are typically required by the code to resist the loads being imposed on the jobs on the uh, building sites. And accommodating movement in the wall has to do with settling, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Many people ask which system is the best, but that's a very subjective question in the sense that uh, all of these systems work well as a, uh, all the components work well as a system. If built the right way, the system you select from at least five criteria will be the best because the producer needs it too. So there's only one way, the right way to build a log home, and that's per the blueprints, details, and instructions provided with that log package. In the 1970s, log producers uh, were armed with only the standards written for lumber and heavy timber. Uh, building codes were starting to become more widely enforced, uh, forcing the producers to uh, come together and uh, address the questions that they're being asked by building officials. In 1977, uh, 22 members united to provide one voice to respond to the influences affecting their market. The first issue was the call for grade marks on logs. While this seems like an uh, unimportant issue because grade marks have been called for in the building codes for quite a while, it was something that the log home industry hadn't been uh, forced to do until it uh, became an issue in the code. The New Log Homes Council first acted by sponsoring the creation of an AFTM standard for grading non rectangular shapes common to log buildings. Published in 1980, AFCM D3957 establishes the methods for developing grades and stress values. Then in 1982, the National Evaluation Service recognized Los Angeles Council Grading Program as an accredited rules writing grading agency, providing third party inspection for the, its member companies. Following that, in 1984, the Los Angeles Council made participation in the credit law grading program mandatory for its membership. And this is the surest the public of the quality of the materials delivered. Law grading was not the only code requirement causing concern, however. The code requirements for fire resistance rated construction called for extensive ASTM U119 test results. And those were, that was an expense that not many companies in the industry could bear. In the meantime, we looked at research on the performance of heavy timber and blue lamb beams provided uh, by Forest Products Laboratories and other uh, research organizations. With such analysis from these, this research and a couple of test results that the Los Angeles Council could pull together, we presented a code change to the urban wildland interface code committee that resulted in an acceptance uh, of log walls in that code for a one hour rated assembly. Uh, the minimum requirement for that wall is that uh, it has to be a six inch thickness at the narrowest point. That brings us to the next hot issue, energy codes. As the codes call for a greater insulation level, Compliance on the basis of ASHRAE standards became increasingly challenging. Lock homeowners supported the benefit of log walls without trade off in, trade off in insulation values and didn't understand it when we were telling them they had to beef up their roof insulation. To demonstrate what the owners experienced, the Lock Homes Council sponsored testing through the National Building Bureau Standards. Two years later, the test demonstrated that a seven inch solid wood wall behaves better than predicted by ASHRAE standards that are based on a one inch thick sample. After considerable work, the thermal mass concept became recognized in the model energy code. Still not reflecting the uh, experience of the homeowners, 
the thermal mask set in the code was still a tremendous step forward for the industry. A standard for evaluating changes in log wall height are being developed today. Uh, this is pertinent to thermal performance because the log building system must respond to settling to maintain proper barriers to air infiltration. Air infiltration is very important to our industry because we feel that a well-constructed log home is as airtight or better than any other form of construction. Some log systems accommodate settling uh, based on how much they estimate, while others use methods to restrict settling. Both systems design their joinery and the openings in the wall to make sure that uh, the wall maintains its proper seal. One example is shown at the, uh, in this photo here where the window is built with about a half inch space above the uh, rough box. That's about the minimum uh, space that we recommend as in general because even a non settling wall by the definition in the log standard, is a wall that cannot be permitted to settle as much as a half an inch. In 2002, the log home industry joined an effort by uh, International Coast Council to write a standard for log building. The goals of the standard are stated on the slide, but more importantly, the standard represents a consensus effort by three groups design professionals, building officials, and an industry that has an extensive range of products and philosophies. It made it very difficult to come up with a consensus standard. The work on the ICC log standard also benefits the work that has been done and will be done in rail check. The minimum requirement to ensure that the estimated performance of the log wall compared to the minimum set in the in the energy code will be met. The ICC standard provides the basis for evaluation, starting with its quality assurance, EOR grading, differential movement and air infiltration, the settling standard, R value and density calculated at equilibrium moisture content. That, that will give us the uh, value and we'll be discussing that further later. And the section properties and average thickness which I want to get into a little bit more. Section properties give us, are related to uh, the structural element of the log, but the area is the calculation that we need for determining average thickness. The stack height, as you see here, we're referring to the center line to center line dimension of the log. Areas can be calculated, as you can see in the table, for round and sawn round timber beams or they can be generated by CAD drawings where the perimeter encloses the area, or they can be taken as an inside rectangle, which is established by STM D3957 and used by grading agencies to assign allowable knot sizes. So using any one of those methods, generating your area and dividing it by the stack height will give you your average log thickness. The next step is to input the average thickness in the res check. I'll let uh, Heather talk about that. But before I close, I'd like to invite you to visit the Lock Homes Council website for more information. We have several technical documents available for free download, including one relating to energy performance. With as many as 30,000 new custom Lock Homes built each year, the work of the Lock Homes Council is and will be significant. That concludes my portion of our webcast. Now, Heather is going to cover the new calculations and log wall in Red Shack. All right. Well, before I get started explaining to you all a little bit about the calculation details, I'm just going to preface this with uh, a note that it's going to be a fairly short discussion, and those of you who aren't as interested in the calculation details will probably be interested in the short demonstration that Pam's going to give on how to use all of this and pull it together in the software. So with that, First, let me uh, thank Rob for that great introduction. He did a good job of outlining some of the history of how we came to this point in the code. Essentially, uh, what had occurred before was in the older versions of RedCheck, those prior to 3.71, the log wall calculations were based on some older assumptions. 
Uh, they were based on an average moisture content, some average assumed weight for all wood types. And those calculations were a little bit older and out of date as this ICC log standard has come into play. So we've been working with Rob and the ICC log standard to implement those calculations in ResCheck, and that version of ResCheck is now available. So let me tell you a little bit about how the typical calculation in ResCheck works. Hopefully you're seeing a slide here that shows a wall. Basically, I just wanted to give you a feel for how heat transfer in the wall might occur. In this case, you're looking at uh, heat flow from the conditioned space to a colder outside air temperature. So we're showing the heat flowing through the wall. Uh, ResCheck handles this calculation by taking into, effect, uh, taking into account certain factors like the inside air film, the outside air film, and then there's the calculation for the R value. So in this case, I've shown this wall as sort of an approximation of, of what you might see as a log. But in, in, in fact, this calculation is actually very similar to what we do for all the, all the walls in ResCheck. So you can sort of just get a feel for what that type of calculation would look like. One of the things that we've noticed over time is that many of our users are not clear about the difference between cavity and continuous insulation. I wanted to talk about this just for a few minutes to uh, give you a little bit of background about this and as it applies to log walls. Essentially, cavity insulation is typically assumed to be something that's installed within the cavity. But the key difference between these two types of insulation is that continuous insulation has no thermal break. So in a traditional framing sense, we would think of continuous insulation as being installed on the outside or in a way that it wasn't interacting with the framing members because those framing members can cause that thermal break. So that's why we make that distinction in the software. I wanted to share that with you because uh, the way that we handle log walls does actually include some of these things. And Pam's going to give you an overview of some alternatives where you can, you can perhaps substitute a framing calculation and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense when she gives you some examples. So what did we change in ResCheck? This is a list of the wood species that are now available in ResCheck. And I looked at here the specific gravities that we use in the calculation. And you should also see the three or four letter species code that is shown uh, or that is associated with each of those species. This, this is just a list to give you a feel for the different types of, of logs that are now available in the software. I know this can be a little bit overwhelming, but uh, as I understand it, most of you are probably building in the log industry with just a few types of these. So hopefully it won't be too much to take in. So how do we calculate an R value for a log wall on a check now? Well, as Rob alluded to earlier, we are doing a moisture correction now for the specific gravity. And that's the first uh, equation I've shown here. The specific gravity uh, calculation does have a uh, constant. That's the small letter A there. I didn't list the values. Those actually change for the different species. But we do have some very comprehensive documentation on this in our technical support document that is available on energycoast.gov. And the ICC log standard actually has documentation on all these calculations as well. From the moisture correction, we calculate the thermal conductivity. You can see that calculation is actually the calculation uh, for K. Again, this calculation uses a couple of uh, constants, in this case, A, B, and C in capitals. You can see the values that are shown there do not actually change for the software. These are assumed for all of the uh, species, and they're valid in the range we're talking about where moisture content is less than 25% for C. And right now we're assuming a moisture content of 12%, 12% for all the climate zones. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why that assumption is in a few minutes. All right, so mass walls. I wanted to spend a minute just uh, defining why we make a distinction in the code about a mass wall. Essentially, a mass wall in the code is just a way to make this distinction about heat storage capabilities. Uh, typically, a mass wall in the code can include other types of walls besides logs. It could be a, a concrete wall or a, a similar structure. But the mass wall credit can be very confusing, and I think this has been one of the, the biggest impacts for our new calculations. Uh, essentially, now the mass wall credit well, the mass wall credit in the, in the code has not changed. Uh, it is what it has always been. But we're calculating it a little bit different than we used to because we have all these species variations. So first, we calculate the density. And that equation is also shown 
here, and the density is uh, based on the specific gravity, again, and the moisture content. From the density, we're able to calculate the heat capacity. And this is where your diameter finding comes into play, your nominal width of your log. And you can see that's actually shown as the variable in D in this equation. And with that, we'll give you a summary of some of the different outcomes of this mass law calculation. We've received many questions about when or where I would receive this mass law, mass law credit in the software. This is an overview chart. Uh, the area shown in blue, shaded in blue, are the species and diameter com combinations that in most cases will give you the thermal mass credit. Uh, this isn't completely true because this is an average charge, but in most cases these are the areas where you're, you will see that mass law credit. In the prior version of Red Check, because of the way the calculation was done, because we did not have variation by species, there was no mass wall credit for uh, five or six inch nominal width logs. So some of those are now able to receive the credit, and you can see that there was a trade off there uh, for the seven and eight inch. So why, why or what might my mass wall credit be? This is a table out of the 2003 IUCC, and I just put this up here to give you a feel for how the credit actually looks in the code or how this calculation actually looks in the code. Again, RedCheck handles all these calculations for you, but we wanted you to have some background about where some of the numbers come from. Essentially, what you're going to find as you do your compliance with log walls is that you will have a mass credit if you fall into the right width and species range, but it will vary by your location. So that's shown in this graph as heating degree days. So the requirements are going to change based on where, you're, where you are in the country. Other things that affect the code will have an impact on this credit, such as window wall ratio, other things that the code is concerned about in that, in that format. So as you're looking at this thermal mass credit and trying to determine if it's going to help you or not, you should remember that there are some variations in how that's applied. And Pam's going to show you how you can check to see if you've received it. All right, well, the calculation future. I put this up because I wanted to let you know that there are perhaps at least one more enhancement we'd like to make in the software as it relates to log walls. And this is just a map that shows the new climate zones. And these are actually climate zones for the 2004 and 2006 IUCC. But we're preparing to put in a slight change in the moisture content that would vary by location. So you can see here that in the future, we may have a slight variation from 10 to 14 percent for different zones. Uh, this hasn't been implemented in the software yet. Right now we're still using a 12% across the country, but our hope is that once we finish implementing these new zones in the software, we'll be able to make this avail available for the log wall calculation as well. So a few things to look for now that we have a new calculation methodology in RevCheck. Uh, the logo shown below is an example of this grade letter that you should be checking in the field. If you're a code official, this is something you need to be checking on the red check report to make sure that the log species is the same in red check as it is in the field. If you are a builder, you should be aware that your code official will probably be looking for this piece of documentation where they might not have been before. Uh, you also need to check the log width. This is actually not changed in the software, and I'm not sure how much enforcement there was of it, but you should be aware that that is still in the red check report. And those widths are very important to the calculation, so that's definitely a key piece to be looking for. Troubleshooting. Uh, we've had several requests that it's still difficult to comply with log homes in the software. Um, this isn't necessarily surprising. Most of the calculation changes we've made have been an improvement in accuracy, but the overall stringency of the uh, calculations is fairly similar to what it was before. So if you're still having trouble complying with RevCheck, there's a couple of things that you can try. Uh, you can consider a lower glazing area, particularly if you're using one of the codes prior to the 2004 IUCC, so 2003 IUCC and earlier. Because of the way the IUCC works, that may provide some benefit to you. Rob informs me that most of the industry actually already uses very efficient windows. But if you happen to be a builder who hasn't uh, already adopted this uh, you might look at it. Most of these windows are pretty inexpensive in the market today, and you can get some very high-performance windows for uh, not, not a lot of additional cost. You can add some insulation. I know this is probably the last resort for many log home builders, 
but we wanted you to understand that that will have a pretty big benefit in terms of your compliance. And it may have a pretty big benefit for your occupants as well. Uh, and the last there is seal the home carefully. You don't actually get any additional credit in res tech for this, but it is a code requirement and it can have a really dramatic impact on the comfort of your occupants. Most of you are probably already aware of all these things, but Pam's going to walk you through how this actually works in the software and what mechanisms uh, you can use within res tech to implement some of these ideas. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pam. Thank you, Heather. Now for the fun part. Where can you go get the software? Go out to DOE's website, www.energycodes.gov, and also the email, techsupport at bcp.pml.gov, if you have any additional questions, especially after this broadcast, go ahead and submit them through that email. The tools that BCP has, just a small breakdown, the desktop version, which you can go download, which I'm going to discuss today, the web-based tools, RESCheck Web is similar to the desktop, requires no download. You'll sign in with a username and password so you can save all of your projects online. You can email them directly to your building departments in either the desktop or web-based version. The RESCheck Package Generator. Typically, this one is not used as much for log home builders because your log walls are not um, defined into individual species. And it's based on prescriptive tables, which is just giving you the recommended R values and the minimum R values that you need to abide by for compliance. And the printed materials as well, they go up to the 2003 IECC. But again, probably for the vast majority of log homes, they're using ResCheck, the desktop, or the web-based version. So here's a screenshot of ResCheck. And I always tell everyone when they upload ResCheck for the first time, you're going to see the loading bar go across the screen. And the first time you upload ResCheck, this might take a couple minutes depending on your system. So give it some time before it loads. Once you upload it once, then each, each time you enter it to, again, it's going to be a lot quicker. So what is new in ResCheck besides the log species? I want to talk a little bit about the mechanical. Since the version of 3.7 release 1B, which is not the most recent release out on the website, but this is where it started, which was a couple months ago, we put a time clock into the software, which is now effective, and that was for January 23rd. The recent release right now, it's already effective. And how this works is this is based on the new NACA requirements, where the baseline for equipment efficiencies have changed from a SEER 13 and an HSPF of 7.7. Originally, they sat at SEER 10 and an HSPF of 6.8. That doesn't mean that you still can't enter those systems at a SEER 10 and a 6.8, but you will not receive a credit towards your building envelope if you do. There are no penalties. The trade-off now starts above the SEER 13 and an HS, HSPF of 7.7. .7. Now, these take effect in all the codes that are available as an option in ResCheck and all the state-specific codes because this is a federal mandate, so it's superseding all of the codes that have been adopted in each state. A few screenshots of what ResCheck has in the desktop version. You will not see these screenshots in the web tool, but let's take a look at some of these. When you click on log wall from ResCheck, you're going to get this screen and it's going to ask you some more information. One of which being, well, what type of wood species do you have? There are several to choose from, so you will define your wood species first. And then you're going to take a look at the thickness, the nominal width. And this is where you're going to do your calculations that Rob discussed and determine which thickness. The thicknesses in red check go from 5 inches to 16 inches. So now let's get into the fun case studies. Before I look at a couple of these case studies and we play around with them, I have a couple pictures and I just want to provide some detail maybe that might help you if you're a new log home builder um, on some options that you might have or some things that you might want to take a look at if you can't get your log home into compliance. First off on this nice picture of this log home is I'm showing the insulation right here. As Heather discussed, the cavity and continuous. On this one it's showing that there's cavity insulation up towards the roof deck and with a type of a plywood sheathing that's on the bottom of the roof deck towards the interior of the house. The other option here would be you could also use rigid foam board, especially if you had open beam. Let's say you, want, you wanted the open beam and then you're going to build above your open beam, that you might have rigid foam board at the roof deck, and then you're going to enter that as continuous insulation in my check. 
So here's my cute simple case study. It was really easy for me to enter in the red check, as you can see. So let's jump over to red check and take a look at what we have. And I'm moving over to red check right now. And we're going to play around with the software a little bit. I'm giving you a little bit of time to start. So bear with me. You might see a couple screens move back and forth. It's being sensitive with me today. All righty. Well, before we start looking at this simple case study, I want to go over some other new things that ResCheck has, if you're not familiar with the most recent version. And that is, first off, there are several codes within the software, and you need to go to the code menu and choose which one's applicable to you. I'm just going to leave it on the 2003 IECC to show these case studies today, but there are some state-specific versions in here, as well as some other national codes. Down in the bottom, bottom left-hand corner, are some new links. So if you're on if you're on RevCheck and you're also connected to the internet, and let's say you're doing your takeoffs and you're looking at your compliance and you're getting really good and you're thinking about going to an Energy Star rating. Well right within the application of this tool, you have a link to get there to give you some more information. Or let's say you're looking at building America beyond code um, certain techniques that you want to put into your home. Well, then again, you have a link to that as well. And then to out to our resource center, which not only has several graphics of different installation techniques, it has FAQs on how to use ResCheck. It has all additional resources where you can go, definitions, glossaries, and so forth, that might assist you while you're doing your takeoffs. Also on the project tab over in the project details, the prior versions of RegCheck, where it says title, site, permit, these were actual entries that you can make individually into these areas. Now we've formatted it so you have to click on the edit project details. And then you have three tabs where you're going to enter your information. So I can come up here and I'm going to put the title of my home and the address and so forth. I can come over to owner and agent and also put my name in. And any other information any other notes or details that I want to show up on my report would go in these three tabs. And when I enter my information and I click OK, it will populate it into your project tab. And you can edit it any time, but any of the information that sits there, that's what's going to show up on your report. And then some more basic overview, overview down at the bottom where it says compliance, compliance passes, your max UA. This is where it's building according to the code that you've chosen what the maximum UA is allowed for your project. And then your proposed UA, which is U factor times area, and then the percentage better than code. Of course, green is always good. If it's in red, that means eh, you're not really meeting the code, and you need to look at some, some different options for your project. Now, over in envelope, to briefly show you quickly about the mass wall credit with logs and how you can determine whether you're getting the mass wall credit. And this is a little, a little tricky. Because if you're really not looking at this, you might not ever see it. The same with all the calculations in the software. All these buttons at the top, you're filling your skylight, have a drop-down list of assembly types. And if you're familiar with RevCheck, you know that each one of those assemblies in the drop-down list already has a calculated U factor. That includes, depending on the component, your air films, jet board, and so forth. And it calculates what that assumption is for that component. What it doesn't know is your square footage, and it doesn't know whether you're insulating it. So when you enter those values, it's going to calculate your overall UA, the U factor times area. It's going to calculate what the overall U factor of that component is. So let's take a look at the log. So I come down to log, and again, I'm going to get the screen that I showed you earlier that pops up that says, well, what's your wood species? Today we're going to be working with eastern white pine. And with eastern white pine, the reason why I chose this, chose this one is because you don't get a mass wall credit until you're above, I think it is, um, 8 inches. That's when you get into the mass wall credit for eastern white pine. So let's leave this one, which is typical, at 6 inches. And let's hit OK. Now in here, I already have a U factor. I'm not going to insulate my log. But let me put in some square footage so we get an overall UA here. And down at the bottom, this is what I want you to pay attention to. The max UA says 256, your UA says 226, and then your percentage. Now, every time you change a component or anything that you're doing in your takeoff, your UA and the percentage, of course, is always going to change because every time you, you change a component, of course, your U factor and UA is going to change. 
But if you're getting into mass law credits, where do you see that you're getting a mass law credit? It's in the max UA. Because now, when it knows you've gone into a fitness where you can receive this credit, and sometimes it can be minimal, depending upon your project and your location, that you need to look at the max UA because that's what's going to increase for your project. Now, I know this isn't typical. You typically don't have a project, and you're saying, well, I'm going to change out my logs. I don't think that's the case. I'm just showing you this because it is really been a question for where do I see this credit? It's the same with the other calculations in here. That's why ResCheck has been so simplified, is that you don't need to look down to detail at all the calculations. It's doing it for you. But as me as a designer and builder myself, I would want to know how those calculations work. And again, as Heather mentioned, if you want to go out to that technical support document, which is out on energycodes.gov, you'd click on residential and down at the bottom where it shows all the res check applications. The, the actual docu document and the methodology of how we develop these calculations, you can download the entire document. And then if you still have questions, then you can send them in to me. So let's take a look now that I'm stuck on this max UA of 256. I'm going to change my log wall. I'm going to actually clear this and I'm going to change my log wall to a new log wall. So let me delete this line item and I'm going to change it to a 9 inch, which is going to give me an additional max UA and it's going to change the compliance results down here at the bottom. So I went up to delete and I'm going to say yes. I would change it, but I'm going to go ahead and just put in a new wall instead. And again, I'll come up and I'm going to click on Eastern White Pine. And now I'm going to go to 9 inches and hit OK. And when I put in my total square footage, which is the same as last time, look at my max UA down at the bottom now. Now I have 304. And I'm looking real good, right? Well, I only got one log wall in there, so I need a full project. But that's how the mass wall credit works in the software. So let's go back over and take a look at that simple case study again so you can memorize it and see how we're going to do these takeoffs for it. And then I'm going to go back into ResCheck again. One second, it's being slow with me today. So as we're looking at this picture, I got this beautiful overhang. And so if I was in an area where I want to take advantage of that, I would probably be showing it. That's only if I'm in an area where the heating degree days is actually 3,500 or uh, less. So let's go into this application. Let's see. Come on. Work with me. Does everyone talk to the computer like I do? I think when I talk to a computer, it actually helps me. All right, now we're back in ResCheck. Let's go open up this example case study. Now, this is a simple, simple building. I wanted to start with a log home that's failing, of course, because I love them when they're failing, because then we can play around with some features. But with this, is it's, it's very basic. So now my, my code at the top, which is defaulted to 2003, my state and location, I'm leaving it in Pennsylvania in the city of Baden. I don't have any project details here. We already went over that. So look down at the bottom it says fails, and here's my max UA and your UA and that I'm not meeting code. So let's go over and take a look at this simple log home project. Now I have two ceiling areas in there. I have a flat ceiling and I'm insulating to 30, and I have a cathedral with rigid foam boards, so that's at the roof deck. I also have my log walls in there. I'm not insulating them. And then my windows and doors. And my window and doors, they look pretty good as far as the use factors and what I'm using. And then the floor over the entire space and insulating that to R30. Well, what can I do to get this log home up into compliance? The first thing that I would look at is the UA column. Now I'm going to look at my biggest hitter. Well, I know it's my logs. Okay, so let's hold off on playing with the log walls because we're not going to give up our log wall construction. So let's take a look at the rest of these UAs and see where we can maximize this building to get it into compliance. The first thing that I would look at is that let's increase our insulation levels to 38 in the ceiling. I, I wouldn't increase my uh, rigid foam board because typically that's already, already came from the manufactured product. And, you, and if you don't have the space to increase your rigid foam board, you're not going to do that anyway. So down on the floor, let's put 38 in the floor instead of 30. Well, it helped me a little bit. My compliance is at 4.7, but I'm still not there. So what else can I do? Well, 
I would be taking a look at my log wall again. And I would also be taking a look at my project. Where can I get some more advantage of getting this into compliance and bring down this 120 UA over here to the right? Maybe I'm going to talk to the client. Now, this is all hypothetical. This log home did not have an attached garage. The garage sat off to the side. Well, let's attach the garage. This is, might be a little bit more in construction as far as cost, but let's attach the garage, and let's take that exterior wall where the garage was where we're going to attach it, and let's move that to a 2 by 6 wall. Of course, you always want to have the aesthetics of all the log walls around the entire perimeter of what you see as the home, but let's attach the garage, and let's now let's subtract this out, of our log walls, which I'm going to say is 150 square feet. So let's move this to 226. And now I'm going to add me another wall to my project. Let's say it's 24 inch on center at 150 square feet, and I'm going to insulate the entire cavity at R19. Now just by doing that, I'm really close to meeting code now. So this is one advantage that you could take advantage of if you cannot get the building into compliance is look at where you can add or increase a two by six wall somewhere. And typically that's with an attached garage is where you're going to show that. You're not going to show, you know, you're not going to give up probably a lot of your logs where you have the aesthetic look, but the garage is a good place to start, which can really help you. And it's brought down my UA from a 120 to a 104. Well, I'm still not meeting code. And if there's nothing else I can do with this project, what else could you do? You're really close then let's go over the mechanical because we haven't entered the mechanical system. And I talked about before, what do you want to do that might help you? Well, I would be wanting to put in this home a high-efficiency furnace. And typically, that's what these log homes have. They don't have heat pumps, unless I'm mistaken. But let's go with the furnace. And the minimums always come up for the efficiencies. And when I talked before about what's changed in res check, it's not on the AFUE side. It's on the HFTF and sphere of your equipment. But you still can get a minimal trade-off if you're above this efficiency, which is at 78. And typically, I think systems that are being installed in these log homes sit about 80 to 90. So let's put in an 85, and let's see if this helps us with compliance. And, of course, it does. It helps us a lot. Now we're meeting code. I'm down at the bottom right-hand corner. It says 7.0% better than code. Well, let's take a look at this um, sphere that I discussed before and how this works. When I click on air conditioner, Typically, you don't put air conditioners in log homes in most, most places of the state. But let's play around with this. It's showing the SEER 13. Now, I can click on that SEER 13 and put up to, or I said lower than, uh, up to, well, up to, down to a SEER 10. I can't put anything less than a 10 because that was the minimum before this new minimum came out of the SEER 13. Now, I'm going to hit OK, and you're going to see it does not penalize me for going lower than the minimum here. If I go above a SEER 13, let's say I put in a SEER 15, watch the compliance results down in the bottom right-hand corner after I hit Enter. It gave me a credit towards my building envelope. This is how the new minimums are working in res checks, similar to the way they worked before, but now these efficiencies have gone up. All right. Let's go back over and take a look at a more complex log home. This is a beautiful log home. It's two and a half stories. This is brought to you by Coombs Brothers Log Homes Incorporated. And I just took some screenshots of this one from the building plans. And I've already populated it in ResCheck, but they've done some features to this home that you might want to consider when you're doing your takeoffs and your projects. And one significant one was up here in the gable ends. Because of the significant amount of heat loss, and if your HVAC contractor is not accounting for the heat loss in this area and you continue to use log construction, you're going to have a cold area out there, and you're going to have heat loss. And one way to work around this is to take your gable ends and turn that into 2 by 6 construction and insulate it. And this will also help you with compliance, as I showed you when you have a garage and you're using that 2 by 6 construction there. Well, the same applies here, and that's what they've done with this home. The other thing that they've also done is down here in the uh, gable ends, it's another nice way to take advantage of that, not at your gable ends, but at your dormers, that you can change this out and use your siding, your log siding, and make it two by six construction for all your dormers. You're not going to aesthetically see the difference, but it's going to help you with compliance. 
here's another schematic of just the side views of this home. And again, this one has a basement. And it's a walkout basement with a slab on grade. Now, they originally could take this home and say, I'm not conditioning the basement. But you get into issues when you do that, is that when you have to go back and re-permit, that what's going to happen when you have to in insulate that slab? What about the drainage and foundation requirements that you might, might be applicable after the fact? There's a lot of things that you might want to consider and you play around with your takeoffs when you're doing a two-and-a-half story or two-story with a walkout and play around with, well, I've got to insulate the floor above the basement. Well, what if it'll help me with compliance that we just get the entire home into compliance now and insulate the entire basement wall? And in this home, it's a very nice home, they've done that. And here's just the actual floor plan of the house. Again, here is the garage, the attached garage, and in this case study, they've done two by six construction and insulated it with R19. And again, here's the bedrooms and with the dormers that sit up in the bedroom areas. And again, this is where they also took advantage of changing out the dormers to a two by six using log siding. So let's go back over to res check. I, I still have the uh, simple case study in here. So if you have a project and you want to switch to another project, you'll want to save it first of all. I already have this one saved, so I'm going to click, click on the little white paper and hit I want a new one and no, I'm not going to save it. And then I'm going to come up and open up one of my recent projects, which is this next case study. I left this 2003 IECC, it's still in Pennsylvania, different city, but all that still applies. Down here, I made it fail. Now, this, this project was not failing. I played around with it and made it fail because I like it when it fails so we can play around with some of the projects. So let's go over here to envelope. The other thing that I did is that this was very detailed, meaning there was a lot of windows and they were all brought over from Area Calc. And I'm going to briefly show you Area Calc. And they defined each out each wall within the project. Now up here in the ceiling, they have a flat ceiling. They have insulated to the R30A, which I showed you in the simple case study. They've left the rigid foam board at 30. Then they have their log walls and the applicable windows that would go under each wall, and they look like very good windows that they're using and doors for this, for this house. The other thing that they've done is if you come down here, a little bit lower to line 7, here is the 2 by 6 construction. Now this is the attached garage and they've insulated it to R19. Also down below, what they've done is the basement. And in the basement, they did their takeoffs, meaning they did the wall height, the depth below grade, and the depth of insulation. And as a reminder, below grade wall, according to code, in residential is if that wall is more than, on an average, 50% below grade, then it is considered a below grade wall, and you'll show it as a basement wall in res check, and you got to define out how you're insulating it. And they've taken advantage of insulating the entire length of the wall. They also took advantage that they are furring it out and putting R19 in that concrete wall. They also have an above grade wall as part of this project that they furred out as well and did R19. And then down in the floor is the slab, the walkout slab. This is the only time that you enter your slab in linear feet. Now, if this is a fully below-grade basement, you're not going to enter your floor. When you have a foundation that is more than 12 inches below grade, according to code, you don't need to show it. And you're not insulating it because the minimal amount of heat loss is insignificant, so you wouldn't show it. The only time you're showing floors is if you had a floor above an unconditioned space, floor above a vented crawl, or you have a walkout and you have exposed slab that you need to show you're insulating. That is if that space is conditioned. And they've taken advantage of that, and they're showing that the basement is a conditioned space. They've also maximized what they're insulating it to with an R10 rigid foam board and the maximum depth, which is four feet. You could enter two feet if you wanted to here, but they went ahead and done a maximum of four feet. So now that we're still failing, what did I really do? I actually didn't mess with this project as far as the building envelope. What I did is that I deleted the mechanical efficiency that they had for this home. So again, I... Let's go back over, and I'm going to enter what they had proposed to do for this house, which was which sat at an 85. So I'm going to go ahead and change it to an 85, and you'll see that they're, they're now in compliance. It's a beautiful home. 
one that I would love to go see after it was built, but I'm sure it's built in around upstate New York somewhere. So anyway, let's go and take a little quick look at area calc. And where you find area calc is, you'll come up to the tools. Now what this, what this tool is, is basically for someone who wants to take advantage of saving any of their windows and doors. Or they want to do their takeoff and simplify. I've got to share the application, so bear with me a minute. And they want to simplify um, doing their takeoffs by hand. And I'm going to share the application. I've got to jump over to it. Give me a second here. Okay, here we go. I've already populated a library with windows that were used for that last case study I showed you. And I can add to that, and I'm going to show you how you do it. Over here to the left-hand side are the windows that are already saved in my library. At, at the top is your tabs, windows, skylights, doors. This is where you can enter all your information. But the only um, components that you can save in the library is your windows, skylights, and doors. The rest of them are basically takeoffs that you can do. So if I click over in the left-hand screen, under assembly type, I'm going to get the drop-down list of the same ones that are in res check on the envelope tab. And I can define out my window. I can put in, let me move this up to my library over just a little bit with the scroll bar there. I can put in, you know, as far as the width and the height, if I wanted to do that. I can also put in the U factor of my component, the solar heat gain efficient, which is this SHGC. I'm going to scroll down here at the bottom because I don't think everyone's seeing this. A little scroll bar down at the bottom. And then I can put any comments I want to to that window. Now, once I'm done with saving that window that I might use for several other homes that I'm building, then I'm going to come over, and this button right here says, do you want to add it to the library? Well, I do want to add it to the library, so I'm going to click OK. And it says, oh, you didn't enter a name. See, I'm not even a good inputter. So let me just enter my name as my window, and then I'm going to hit the arrow button. Now you'll see it drop down into my library. It, the library will automatically that automatically come up every time you go into area calc. It's a file that actually is saved into the application folders of ResCheck. So rest assured, when you save it over the library, you're going to see that library every time. Now, some neat features also with area calc when you're doing Windows and you're adding them. Let's add a couple more here. I'm clicking on the library and it populated over here. I can change the quantities of those windows if I want to. But a nice feature that's also available with this, is that there is a view computed data screen that comes up. And this is where if you're actually doing takeoffs and you're in the 2003 or later version and you really need to be looking at your window to wall ratio, which is the rough opening of your windows divided by the rough opening of all your gross square footage of all your walls, gives your percentage of window wall ratio, which is your glazing percentage, all glass, then you can do it by pulling up this calculator and it's doing it for you. Each one of these screens can be fine-tuned to what you want to see. So I could be looking at my percentage, I could look, be looking at my, if I had skylights, my skylight average SHGC or any of these values. And I can move this around and keep it with me as I'm running my takeoffs for my windows. The other nice feature is, let me close this out, is that once I've entered all my windows for my project, I can save it here if I wanted just a schedule that maybe I want to attach, or I can come up to Tools, and I'm going to transfer that data to ResCheck. Now, be careful when you do that. Any of the information you have in your schedules when you're transferring it over to ResCheck, it doesn't know where those windows sit. So if you have several walls that you've already entered over into ResCheck, it's going to throw it under the first wall. And all you need to do is highlight that window and just hold your mouse down and move it to the wall that it needs to be under. Another tool that's in here is a shape calculator. So let's say you're entering your library for the first time. This is a pretty slick shape calculator because it'll help you with those, those neat windows that sit in these beautiful homes that maybe have, you know, an octagon window and so forth where you can take advantage of letting it calculate out yourself. And then you can save those windows in there. Let's move over to how the calculations work for the ceilings, the walls, and the other components where you don't really save it to a library. So I clicked on ceiling. Now I need to click in assembly type to get that drop down list that comes from ResCheck. Then I can define out my ceiling and then I can do 
whatever I want to do here as far as my width times the length, which that is really a large number. I'm just, I'm just giving you an example. So now that you've entered your information, again, the same thing would apply. It would carry this over to ResCheck. Any of the information in these tabs, it would carry over. But with the components here, not the windows, the skylights, the doors, where you might have put in your view factor, hopefully, you need to also provide the insulation value if there is one. If you forget to do this when you're playing with area calc, what will happen in ResCheck is that you will see those values will show up, not the insulation, but if it was a use factor, something mandatory that ResCheck needed to actually calculate compliance, it will show up in red. So look for things in red, but be careful when using this tool if you're using your the ceiling, walls, and basements because it doesn't know that you, you're not insulating that component. Maybe you're not. So that's not going to show up in red. You just got to make sure that you get in the habit of when you transfer it over, you enter those values if you have them, if you're insulating it. Or you're going to be spending some time going, what what did I do? I need to go back to the building plans. I better check all my square footages. I must have entered something wrong. All right, let's get back over to the presentation. Now, that ends my demo for ResCheck. Again, if you have questions and comments, there's two avenues to do that. I gave you the tech support email that you can take down. And then if you forget that or you don't write it down, if you go out to our website, there is a help desk online electronic form that you can go to, fill out your name, and submit your question that way, and they come right in, and we will answer them. Thank you for attending our session today. This ends the training video. If you would like to take the test to receive AIA credit and or print a certificate of completion, please write down the URL shown on the screen. You will need to type this URL into your internet browser. Thank you.